how much of because you're an observer. Mm-hmm. You know, we had a little chat before we jumped on. You understand? You, you've very, got to do that. Though, yeah, you? you have to, right? You, yeah, you've got yeah. to be an observer. Yeah. Right, you've got to observe and understand nuances, read the room. Yeah, yeah. H- how much of that do you process? How much of that input do you put into your way of thinking when getting uh, into, uh, you into know, rap mode? I would say it, it, it has to start with um, the, the music has to catch me first to make me feel inspired. And usually, like when I hear a track I like, I will. It's like uh, there's, a, you know, a screen goes down, and it's like I'm getting imagery that I want to try and write out. So within that, there'll be observations about things that I might have seen, but it's not. It's not so conscious, like you know, someone's pissed me off, so I'm like, right, I'm gonna write a song about this. Mm-hmm, you know, mm-hmm. is is or or even I feel really strongly about this, so I'm gonna talk about it right now. It's always the feeling that finds me first before I put the ideas and words to it, basically, is what I'm you saying. You hear that? You hear that? He even said it like a lyricist. The Killer Killer Podcast. The Killer Killer Official Street Culture TV. Beatbox created. Killer Killer. And we need to talk about world music and street culture. Killer Killer Podcast. Ladies and gentlemen, Killer Keller Podcast, live and direct, central London, or central as you need to be, care to be, choose to be, desire to be, your choice, but I warn you, you don't want to be anywhere else. Coming to you live from uh, the pod trap. Uh, big shout out to everyone has got the Kellervision app. Uh, move swiftly forward, free download, iPhone, Android for the sport in art and all the street culture activities you may need, yeah, from everything, from podcasts to mini mixes, mini docs, big docs, it's all there. Inside the house today. There are a few pockets of this world that we call street culture um, that house some of the original pioneers and players, the movers and shapers and shifters, uh, a lot of unsung heroes, a lot of uh, fault lines that lie, that, that amount to what grime and drill is now. There were some purveyors, and one of them purveyors, collaborator of many, from Doc Brown to Sway, the Last Skeptic, and beyond. You can hear Pop's very own, the ultimate verb, T inside the place. Big up, man. How Thank you? you for having me. I'm doing good. <laughs> I am doing good. I'm, I'm here. Uh, you've travelled, yeah. haven't you, brother? I have done, yeah. I live uh, on the south coast now, so uh, I came from sunny Bournemouth mm. all the way here to be in the pod trap mm. with you to discuss this beautiful culture that we were both a part of and yeah. met many years ago through. Yeah, we did, didn't we? Yeah, we did. I remember Very close to here, funnily enough. Yes, just up the road. Uh, we won't give too many details of the postcode, but... Central. Uh, <laughs> big shout, northwest all day. Uh, yes, yeah, central. <laughs> Uh, big up Harry Love. I mean, what yeah, a man. pivotal character in the UK hip hop scene. Huh? Yeah, and that studio spot that we met at, I met a lot of people there. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Everyone passed through there at one point. And uh, yeah, when uh, when you came through that day, I specifically remember he was starting to put together the beat for Boom Accessories, I believe. Ooh, yeah. From yes. your album. Yeah, beautiful. It's before that album came into existence fully yeah. and was released to the world. And mm. yeah, man, that's that was the start of when we met. And mm. it was at the beginning of... My career, I guess, kind of your career too, right? Yeah, I always found, and correct me if I'm wrong, like, when I was introduced to this... I mean, Harry's an anomaly, man. Like, he... I, I was in the same crew as him, for starters, but, mm. but it's more so that his age, you know, did not determine his trajectory. He was just in it, he was embraced, and some of the techniques he was doing in yeah. the studio were way advanced, to, to for, for not only for his age, but for, for what other people were doing. Oh, absolutely. He was a prodigy, 100%. Yeah. And I, I feel like um, it, it, a lot of it was... It starts with being able to replicate what you hear... Um, and he just moved straight past that stage and kind of had his own thing with it and was making productions that didn't sound like what anyone anyone else was doing here. Um, And it was from just learning the equipment, like thinking about, you know, if he wanted to do something, how do I make it sound like this? He would find out, Mm. and then he'd find a way to flip it in the way that he wanted to use it for what he was making. Mm. And he always gives love and respect to the people that influenced him, but he went on and did his thing, and... Had some classics, yeah. you know what I mean? Some so, real classics. And, 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 and you. 
as well. Yeah, well, we, we yeah we did a full album together um, over many years. Like we, what it was like we just made songs all the time and eventually got it together to put an album out. Mm. And uh, we had other singles apart from that. Obviously, he he had his production. Mm. I had my other projects I worked on. But that was the foundation of it all. Like me and him working together in the studio, and then just that environment. Like you know, I have to shout like Young Gun and Maestro. Of course. Um, yeah. You know, our guy Big Red, uh, his brother Jetson, mm -hmm. like all these people that were around at that time. Kaiser. Kaiser, of course. Parky. Yeah. Parky, there you go. Like all these people, you know, the last two you just mentioned and a lot of the others from this area too, mm. or from nearby anyway, yeah. um, all passing through the same spot and sharpening our skills, basically. It's mad, isn't it, how... Yeah. And, and Carrie's a great example. I remember bringing, again, Boom Accessories, which was on the first album I did, uh, Permanent Marker. Mm. Uh, his techniques and processes. I often got... It's on the, the SP, right? That the, exactly. Yeah. And the, and he was using the tape, a normal tape, yeah. cassette tape, to record it in for oh, the warmth. Yeah, that, do you remember uh, that? Yeah, 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 I do. This was like an do, era for him, wasn't it? It was, yeah. And what's strange is that he... Uh, and this was the immediacy of how I figured you guys all come together based on vibe. If they ain't there, if you ain't there and there ain't no vibe, then sh shit gets done differently, mm -hmm. if at all. It's like you guys were this close that it, it was momentum. Yeah, well, I mean, we we would just hang out all the time and other people would pass through. And we were always listening to music, watching films, like smoking, like, you know, going to shows. And all of that was like inspiration for wanting to be creative ourselves mm. um and and it, we, we just naturally i saw him he watched the film juice and was like i want a dj changed everything yeah, yeah 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 and that was a classic like and um so he started to dj i had already written rhymes at that point i mean i wanted to rap ever since i heard the first hip hop record that mm. I heard. What was the first one you heard? It was uh, Ladi Dadi, nice. Slick Rick and Dougie Fresh. Yeah, so that was what I, I wanted to be Slick Rick basically when I was eight and first <laughs> heard that. And then I just wanted to be writing rhymes after that. Mm. I say in my teen years when Harry seriously started DJing, that's when I was like, okay, I'm going to seriously start writing because it was more of a thing, I think, back then, like DJ MC combos. Mm. But then he started making beats and he was instantly good at it. So we started making tracks. Mm. And you guys are like two-headed monsters, man. I remember this very, very well. Like, you guys, as a collaborative duo, it mm. was that Slick Rick, Dougie Fresh, or, you know, those kind of pairings, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah, it, you know, it was. It was It was a duo. Like, yeah, and it was because um, we were, like, bouncing off what each other was doing. And then I think there was a point where in all honesty, I feel like his skills just went like that. Mm. And I still had a lot to learn as an MC. Not to say I wasn't good, but I was still, like, with him, it was just a straight-up trajectory. And me, it took a bit more time. Um, but then, you know, we, I I worked with other producers too. I started doing collaborations with other MCs. And all these things are how you sharpen your skills. And um, Do you think that's what counts? Is that Because sometimes you, you go out of your comfort zone, outside the circle, you record with certain people only to bring back that information, feed it back into the circle. Yeah, always, yeah, definitely, definitely. I think it is important to an extent, I mean, not necessarily to go outside the circle. I, I didn't necessarily look at it like that so much. It was all, like, we were all a big collective, really, the way I looked at it. At mm. one point, I feel like things get tricky, don't they? Like, when something becomes a business and someone starts making money and then dynamics shift and yeah. people fall out and stuff but me and Harry at the core of it were always friends so we never had any of them type of problems mm. but obviously we worked we collaborated with plenty of people and yeah we did bring that back like you know he'll produce something for one person I'll write a song with another person I'll work with another producer and then when we work together it's like there's different techniques that we learned individually that feed back into the work that we're doing and mm. I think that's how it should be really I think that's the that's the beauty of creation, really, in this type of this type of field. Field, so lucky to be in this for like Northwest Labrick Grove. Yeah, how yeah, was yeah. It, how was it for growing up back in the day? Um, so I I was from South London when I was about eleven. Um, was living in Labrick Grove from then until like maybe eighteen, nineteen. So my whole teen years, and it was like that's that's in the nineties when 
um, I was really falling in love with hip hop as a, you know, as as a music, but also as like a way of life, you mm. know, like a. I don't know. It's, I always say it's like a religion. Basically, it's like a faith because mm. it's about more than just the music. Is that there's when 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 you're really like you know involved in it and part of mm. part of a bigger thing it's like it's not about you it's about the collective and that's yeah. we really had that back then it, it, that was really how it was back then and um yeah i can't really even remember what the question was i got kind well, of well no no because there. back in the day growing up if you haven't got all the tribe shall we say as a young person that you associate yourself with that religious aspect of any music, whether it's rock, whether it's drum and bass rave, right. or it's hip hop, and it, 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 but when you find something that is truly dynamic enough to capture you in so many different sensory ways, yeah, that's really what hip hop was for a young person, wasn't it? Yeah, and the the MCs I listened to were like teachers to me. You yeah. know, it's like you you learn things about life because it's put in within a framework where you like the sound of the music. You you relate to the words that are being said, or you can appreciate the motion emotion being expressed. You learn mm. things from it. Um, but yeah, in fact, to go back to what you were saying, so this was a perfect area for it because, for example, there was Honest John's records right near my house, oh God, yeah. and I went and bought <laughs> all the classics from that shop as they came out. Um, and so it, there was like my education in mm. hip hop. Um, obviously, you know, had things like Carnival where you you got. Oh um, man, you were so lucky, music. bro. Yeah, yeah, you know, and Ooh. Subterranea, seeing all the mm. people perform at Subterranea and the artists that are in the area, it's a very creative area too. Mm. Plus, we spent a lot of time at uh, Deal Real Record Shop um, mm. th when it was on Knoll Street, I believe. Mm -hmm. Sort of like, you know. Golden era. Shouts to oh. Pete, Tony, yeah. Shorty, yeah. MK, all the people that, that were there. And, th and that was another yeah. thing where it was. Because Harry was in the mix as well. He was, yeah. He as he well as Estelle and all those guys. Yeah, like, like everyone passed through there at that point. There's, we were talking before, weren't we, about the legendary photos that have been taken there and mm. the people that have passed through. Mm. Um, that whole area was glorious, man. It was wasn't it? Yeah, it really was. In fact, we actually bumped into uh, Doc Brown outside. That's we did. A we did. Yeah. Photo we just got there. Oh man, yeah. That was that was those moments are nice. Those moments are nice. And again, Very... celebrating the area in itself as being quite the, the hub for uh, hip hop. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Isn't that something? So, so as a kid, you were absorbing all of this, and and when you suddenly meet people that are of, a, of an age, it that are into the same thing as you. Yeah. It drives the cause even more. It gives, it's almost like a, an okay sign. It's like, yeah, 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 we're all in this then. All yeah. doing, you don't need them, but it's there. And mm -hmm. then that, because this is how UK hip hop kind of was forged. Like you said, deal real records. It almost became like the central place to just meet people. Well, that's what it is. When there's a hub like that, um, that's what it does. It, it creates community. Um, and so that was one of those places that did that. For sure. Verb T, the lyricist, vocally. Um, because I think the... <sighs> this could sound... No, I'm going to say... The UK, there's a UK... Hip, and I was a part of it. <laughs> there's a UK hip-hop droll. There's a climate for UK hip-hop of, of that time. It's, it, re, it reflecting on a working class. It's reflecting on a social uh, point of view. Uh slightly more dowdier approach more uh for the people right do you know what i'm saying like it, the boom batness of it right which which heralded a real moment in time you know looking back on it yeah it's almost like a time capsule of it's almost like it it, it holds weight mm -hmm. it does it doesn't age yeah i mean do you know what i'm saying yeah 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 it's, yeah. it's almost made itself, it, it's gone back full cycle and it, and it still feels as relevant and true, more true than things that are out now. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think it's, it's, it's down to connection, isn't it, though? I mean, people are always going to connect with a sound that hits them on a certain level. And, mm. um, there are moments in time 
that that do that. There's certain albums that capture a moment so well that they live on forever. Mm. And there's, I guess, if we're talking UK hip hop, I would look at say Skinny Man, Council of State of Mind. Yes. The reason it's a classic is because it encapsulated an era, and the things you were talking about transcend beyond that era. But the sound is reminiscent of that era, so the messages last. I would say um, the same thing about your. I'd say about Broken Window though. Yeah. For sure. Yeah, like yeah. When you look um, at the collaborations on that and how important, significant each one of those. Oh were. yeah, I mean, it's a massive, it's a massive moment for me. Um, I mean, every, every album I made is a moment for me. I don't. It's harder to look at my own work and say what relevance it is to other people. I, I know I'm still here, so mm. I, I know there's people that are out there supporting what I do. But um, I mean, I'm 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 still going, so I, I don't I don't really I don't look back all that often. Maybe not as often as I should uh, about my own my own work you, cra- you, you guys c- kind of and this also falls into maybe the Kung Fu era uh, which was a club night that used to go on in Camden you understand a UK hip hop one very good one it was a good uh, one it was a good it was, one wasn't it? Yeah. but this was a moment in time where the energy was so high like yeah. I said went from one extreme of like you know kind of window gazing at what's going on mm-hmm. to actually <laughs> went full cycle to actually you're actually present and, and actually dictating what socially is going on with the with the UK scene? Yeah, I mean, yeah, it became another hub. It became, there was open mics, so MCs would go down to have a chance to get on that stage. Um, different acts came through. There was always more than one headliner. The The back room was always crazy busy, as I'm sure yeah, you remember, yeah, yeah, yeah. with artists. Um, and it was a hub for those artists, but also the fans. It was It was a concert to go to and something to watch, but it was also a hub to be part of I don't want to say movement, but I guess it kind of was mm. a, a bit of a movement as well. And it also it coincided with low life becoming very popular as well. Yeah. So there, I think there was a bit of a tie in there too. It was, wasn't there? Yeah. Low life. Uh... And and also Kemet Records, obviously, yeah. like Kaiser Kalashnikov, Scribbler, yeah. like the Terra Firma, like that. You know, um, obviously Roots Maneuver was uh, doing amazing things yeah. and played. Played at Kung Fu, you know. Headlined. Task Force. Task Force, exactly. Course, Skinny, exactly. Uh, Black Twang. I mean, so it was it was it, it was a, it was a real sim- symbolic moment of because you would have back in the day it used to be Scratch, mm-hmm. Deck Effects, all those things. They, you, they were more DJ focused. That's though, right? right. Yeah. This was more, and also they had disbanded. A lot of that had gone by that time. Yeah, that's true. That's so, true. So the, it was almost, it, for me, it felt like Kung Fu was actually a call to arms. Well, it was, but this is what happens. Like, it's it, things build up, fall apart. Then there's a remnants of it in a bit of a quiet period. And then they, they, they come back again. It's a similar thing with, you know, low life was big. That finished. There was a bit of a gap. And I feel like Kai Focus came in and was was a movement Again, in itself yeah, yeah there, and and there's been plenty of other movements um but yeah i mean the and then you know there's waves mm. that, that that things happen in and there's quiet periods in this and for me being in it this long i've i've always kind of seen it like well you just ride through the quiet period and then you wait for the wave and and it always comes you know talk to me about that that journey like particularly as a lyric a lyricist, mm-hmm. as a rapper, vocalist. How much of... Because you're an observer. Mm-hmm. You know, we had a little chat before we jumped on, you understand? You, you're very, you've got to do that. Yeah. You? you have to, right? You, yeah, you've got yeah. to be an observer. Yeah. Right, you've got to observe and understand nuances, read the room. Yeah. Yeah. How, how much of that do you process? How much of that input do you put into... Your way of thinking when getting uh, into, I, you into know, rap mode. I would say it, it it has to start with um the the music has to catch me first to make me feel inspired. And usually like when I hear a track I like, I will it's like a, there's a you know, a screen goes down and it's like I'm getting imagery that I wanna try and write out. So Within that, there'll be observations about things that I might have seen, but it's not it's not so conscious like, you know, someone's pissed me off. So I'm like, right, I'm going to write a song about this. Mm-hmm, you know, mm-hmm. is, 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 or, or even I feel really strongly about this, so I'm going to talk about it right now. 
It's always the feeling that finds me first before I put the ideas and words to it, basically, is what I'm you saying. You hear that? You hear that? He even said it like a lyricist. That's <laughs> deep, <laughs> bruv. Yeah, well, that's how it is. That's, that's how it is. I think there's sometimes where, say, when I'm working with the owls, because there's four of us, we have to be on the same page. So we'll often come up with a concept or someone will set it off and say, this is what the song's about. Mm -hmm. And I also like working like that because then it's like, okay, so this this came up in the talk we just had with with Doc now, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's that whole thing of show and prove, mm -hmm. the show and prove mentality. So if someone says, right, I've got the songs about this, what what you know, you, you think to yourself, what is it I've got to say about this this idea? And then and then oh, I'm on a track with someone else. Okay, so I've got to be good. I can't just yeah, yeah. throw especially when it's your group and it's anyway, so Well there's a comp when you work working with anyone, there's a competitive element, isn't it? Of course. Of that's course. It, that's, yeah. I mean we, we know this. Like mm. it's MCing is a competitive sport, isn't it? Mm. Let's be honest. It, it is. It, like it's also a collaborative sport. It's also a team sport. <laughs> but there's still competition. Even within a team, you're mm. gonna, everyone's gonna want to shine mm. as well, aren't they? Mm. Um, but anyway, so I like working in that way where there's an idea. But if I'm doing a solo project, it's got to be all from the place of feeling. And then within the group projects, it's like certain songs, I'll get that same thing and I'll start the song off. Mm. But the thing I like about working in a group is it is different where you can let someone else take the lead and then you can add your piece to it. Mm. and that that is uh yeah that's another way of working which i also enjoy i would imagine nothing beats that when you when all of a sudden someone says something within a track and that could forge an idea in your head that would take it somewhere it could even turn it into a chorus could turn it into a middle eight it could yeah exactly exactly <sighs> exactly that uh but staying on focus with, with your individual music for a sec, we will get into to the other collaboratives, the four hours and all that. Um, you said it was like putting the shutters down to a screen in your head. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and you said yeah, Baywatch yeah. on one of his tunes. And I was like, bruv, <laughs> you've been, have you been spying on me watching fucking Baywatch because I was bored fucking sitting and doing nothing? It's like you are, that, that in itself is a telltale sign of somebody that has a level of empathy to, to the listener and knows what the audience would be uh, tuning into. Not, not Baywatch, obviously, but tuning yeah. into from a psyche point of well, view. Well, yeah, it's, it's funny because... With with that particular track, like with the Where You Find Me track, um, when I made that, it felt like, oh, this, it was kind of a tongue-in-cheek joke song, which I think kind of comes across. Yeah, for sure. But um, I thought, oh, is it, is it too silly? But then I was like, no, because I, I think there's other people that will feel like that. But that yeah. came after writing it. So I didn't write it thinking it was as relatable as it turned out to be mm. from the feedback I get about the song. And it makes sense though, because, you know, when you talk, we're, we're not that special, we're not that individual, like we're all the same in many ways. So mm. when you hit on something that is, that a lot of people feel, then you feel like it's personal to you, mm. but it's not that personal because we're all the same and there's everyone has that, I just want to stay in, I just want to sit on my sofa and, watch it or if someone's my age oh yeah then they've been chilling since the 90s mm. listening to watching blockbusters watching Baywatch listening <laughs> to this music and the little you know at the end of the video there's that little mm -hmm. slideshow of the yeah the 90s imagery so it's kind of what when you said the screen down that's kind of what I thought yeah you, you know it, that's a good representation of it I didn't even think about that but that's yeah. true that's kind of what it is like screen will go down and those type of things would flash up in my head like whatever or if I'm writing a dark song, there might be some misty, you know, empty streets in the early hours of mm. the morning and I'm just walking through it and I'm trying to describe what I'm feeling while I'm there. And then from that, subconsciously, a deeper idea will show up. It, oh, maybe I'm writing about depression right yeah. now. Maybe I'm writing about isolation right now. And then I'll key in more on that feeling where it's mm. coming from. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, I do know what you mean. Yeah. Those are real personal elements to, to any tune that actually a lot of artists refuse to go down. Do you, when you listen back, because you've got a fucking catalogue, <laughs> okay? Uh, too many, if Yo, you ask me. Nah, well, <laughs> never enough if, if you're anyone like me that, you know, the, we deep dive in these things. It's like you can, you know, marathons. But do you ever listen back as a, as a body of work 
is it relatable? Is 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 your first incarnations? Can you? Does it teach you, you about you? You, you know, know what? You know what I mean? Funnily enough, yes. I don't listen back. So my thing is, before I release an album, I'll listen to it fucking loads. Mm. I'll just have it on repeat and I'll be scrutinising and analysing every bit of it, both from a technical point of view, like that flow is not quite right. I don't think that verse matches the beat well enough. Things like this. Yeah. And then the album track list will chop and change and to a point where... I like how it runs yeah. and I'm happy no, right now, right here, I think I've expressed what I wanted to express as a whole body of work. Then once it's out, it's for everyone else and I don't go back to it until years down the line. So I did have a point recently before I finished this last album I've just finished where I was listening back to old stuff because it's not to compare it to the new one, but it's to say, okay, what, where was I at on these where am I at now? What have we learned kind of thing? Yeah, yeah, and how, how does it fit in? How does it follow on? Um, you know, how does this one stand up? And how do I think the new one may stand up in a few years? Mm. And there's no definitive answer to these questions, but it's just things I like to consider because you get a fe more of a feeling for the project after doing that. Mm. So, but in terms of is it relatable, sometimes I'll listen back and think, yep, I, I you know, I was really... Yeah, this is I've I've said this already. So that's another thing. Like, if there's a song on a new album where I feel like this is just a repeat of such and such a song, I can't. You know, I don't want to do the same thing again. Obviously, there are recurring themes in my album because they're personal. Mm. You know, so there are recurring themes in my life. But each album, I can say when I go back to it, I was like, man, I really see where I was at. Like, for example, the morning process. Mm. I wrote the morning process song because. Uh, my writing window at that point was like five to seven in the morning. So yeah. I literally wrote that while waking up and I literally was kind of nodding off at parts where I got to a certain point, I can't think of the next line and I just sat there and nodded off. I was like, oh, I'll put that in the next line, you know. This, that's how that song came about. So, and also there was other parts of it. There's a song in there. I can't remember the name of the song now, but it's quite a dark song where I'm talking about being in hospital and when I was in hospital, um, I watched The Man Who Fell to Earth with David Bowie. And there's a part, it's an alien yeah. who gets experimented on. And so, like, in a dramatic sense, I portrayed myself as that guy, even, you know, even though, obviously, I wasn't going through the same experience as that character. But yeah. it's just artistic expression. So, it, But anyway, it takes me right back to literally lying in that hospital bed in St. Thomas's. So, is that what it does when you listen back to it? That particular song, yeah. Oh, man, that must but be But also crazy. other songs, they'll take me back to... I can remember where I wrote some of those songs and exactly the frame of mind I was in when really? I listened to them. Others are more random. It's like, I don't even remember making that. You know, and other, other stuff I listen back to, is like, yeah, I'm talking shit, that's whack. <laughs> like, yeah. yeah. But that doesn't uh, matter because yeah. it's like... I always say it's like seeing an old photo of yourself. It's like, oh, it's not a good photo. I wasn't... I don't know what I was wearing there, yeah. but, you know, whatever. That <laughs> yeah. was the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think... Always blame it on the time. Yeah. Uh, you, you're very lucky in that respect. I think a lot of people too, are, are too overly critical. You know what I mean, like, the, 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 the consumer doesn't think that deep. And I guess as artists, we've just got to accept that the, the, the pour, pouring of output is essential yeah. for, for your own creative growth. Definitely. 100%. 100%. Hmm. And... Just going back to actually being outside with Doc Brown and, and him explaining, because, you know, you guys jumped on a collaboration only very recently. This is hot news, baby. Um, and uh, he, you know, he openly admits, you know, I can't write my... I can't be in a room and write songs for myself. He almost needs the challenge and a timeline, deadline. He needs all that stuff to... And collaborate more mm -hmm. so than do his own shit, right? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, but I think, you know, I think it's like he was saying, like you're... Our focus is shift, so he he hasn't lost any of the ability or the the skills to be able to write, but it's just there's not the same drive because other things take over in life sometimes, and he's successful in many areas. So it, it's it's music isn't the primary focus, but the the love of it is still a hundred percent there. The skills are still there, and it just takes that that little 
challenge, that little show and mm. prove, like, you know. The you youngster know. in you suddenly kicked yeah, in. Yeah, 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 exactly. And especially, I guess, because, you know, he, he was one of those people that came through Harry's that mm. I met there, um, you know, the Poisonous Poets when they were doing that mixtape. Mm. I was in, I was in literally the next room listening to them record Poisonous Poetry. So I've known Doc Mad. since then. So when me and Doc talk, we, we probably are just going straight back to how we felt back then because, yeah. you know, if you're talking about music, we both came from that that point in time, you know, we, we, we were both active then and chasing it then. And so I guess there's there's still a connection to that, like when we collaborate, which is which is cool. And, and we did an FA Cup song for Crystal Palace. Don't forget that Woo! when Palace... Hey, win. come on. <laughs> Look, guys, you have to understand, like for those of you that are stepping into the podcast, you know, we only delivered the, the real and the raw here. Uh, we're talking here to somebody that was, was so pivotal in the direction of UK hip hop. Like that whole space in Northwest, Harry, Poisonous Poets. Do you know what I mean? Like, the, the seminal moments, man. I can't quite get... It's, it, without it, there were no signature songs like Terra Farmer, uh, tracks from those guys, from your guys, the, 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 the 19 Long Times, mm. the Oh So Rottens, the, uh, you know, Parky, you know, to, to, to get to this point where... Me, myself, and Akai, he's, he's, he's seminal on a T-shirt as much as it is as an, as a, 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 an album of relevance. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you were such a big part of that. Yeah, I part mean... all I, of it. Well, I, 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 was, I, was, uh, I was there. I was there, you know. I was a, a part of the, the structure as a whole yeah. for a long time. So I had my part in it, but, you know... I, I just feel like I've just been here a long time. <laughs> like I just, <laughs> I've just maintained, you know. Um, so, yeah, I I don't know. I, I I don't know how much I've personally, uh, you know, changed or pushed things forward. But I do know I've been here and I've been active in in this mm. for a very long time. Mm. Yeah. Verb fucking T, man. Uh, let's uh, let's cycle a little bit further forward. Uh, four hours. Mm. Now how. You know, was it? This is how I'm imagining it, right? Yeah. You're there with the with the movie on in your head, writing away, minding your business, and then you just get a call. It's like, yo, it's like the bat phone sort of shit. Yeah. Like, yo, you down? You want to be in? How did it all begin? You know, I, I mean, it's it's kind of like that a little bit. I mean, <laughs> so the basically the way it started is the other three guys um, started making the album, the first album, Nature's Greatest Mystery. And I was originally going to feature on one track, which was Life in the Balance. Um, and I was working on the Morning Process album at the time, so I was really wrapped up in that. Like, when I'm working on an album, it just consumes my head until it's finished. Mm -hmm. And I can't switch it off. It's just on constantly in the background somewhere, if not in the forefront. Mm -hmm. So I was in that frame of mind. Um, but because of that, I was writing loads. Hard. Um, and so... I've got Life in the Balance, they, they, I wrote it pretty quickly, did the hook. And then I, I think it was Flip Tricks really first said, you know, maybe you could be a part of the group as a whole, like if there's a few, because I was saying there's a few I like, so he's saying, yeah, maybe do verses to a couple. And then uh, I can't remember exactly how it went, but from that to him saying, yeah, I mean, why don't you be part of the group? Yeah, yeah. Um, and funnily enough, I had met Leaf and Beef earlier when uh, me and Kashmir, I have to shout out Kashmir, that's one yeah, of the yeah, yeah, important yeah. people in the journey we'll talk. as well and yeah. in, in the UK hip hop journey as a whole. Thousand percent, yeah. Um, and yeah, so he, you know, um, Flip Tricks had been on tours with me and Cash um, and so it was kind of, this is before High Focus existed. Then once High Focus existed, um, I, I was working with Flip Tricks at that point and had planned to do this album I was working on. I didn't have a home for it, so it made sense to do it with him. I was working on that. And anyway, when me and Cash had a gig years back, I met Leaf and Beave when they were just kids <laughs> and they, they happened to be on the support bill for a show we did one night. 
And it's just mad that it came around to me and them being in a group together. Um, but uh, yeah, so I met them way back then, but I only really properly met them after agreeing to be in the group, which is kind of weird. But then, mm. man, it's just... So we spent time crafting that album, doing shows to promote that tour. Mm. Um, and then it it blew up more than I thought any of us realised it would. And so for that second album, by that point we'd been touring loads, like we'd proper solidified as a group. Yeah. And, uh, you know, you know that, that that's family right there. Yeah. Um, and so the second album, that was more reflected. So it was more like the first album was us. It was just the hunger of like four people trying to outdo each other. And then the second album, I feel like we re what well, not just trying to outdo each other. That makes it sound like it's more competitive than it was, but it was just trying to put together smelling the best, each other's scent and shit. You just know, just put, putting together the best project we could. But it was more like off the cuff, whereas the second one was super considered, and obviously we worked with Premier on that one, which was fucking massive for yeah, us yeah, yeah. as a group as well as individually. Yeah, crazy. Um, and that took us on just show shows all over and all the time and it was a really busy time for for us in that respect um and then yeah then then it grew to a level where you know we were just about to put out that third album and it took us a fucking long time to to get around to actually making that third album mm. and coming up with something that we thought okay this is good enough now this it's it's it, we can put this out and then we had a massive tour hooked up. Obviously, that's when all the shows stopped, everything shut down. And um, I feel like that knocked everything a little bit, but um, we are coming back now uh, with Jeez. with some new music. Um, I, I, I don't know exactly. I, I, I kind of feel like maybe next year... Uh, people will hear some stuff from us, but Full you know, of exclusives we, on this we, show. Yeah, today. we, we wow. still got some work to do, but but we're we're getting there, man. We are getting there, and you know, we just finished a, a UK tour, which was cool, and yeah, like I say, that's family now. So yeah. it's funny how it goes from, you know, just something we thought was going to be a one-off project, maybe that's just under an alias of the Four Hours, and they when it was just the three of them, they were going to be called the Al Trinity. El Trinity. And, and then when I became involved, <coughs> it was going to just be called The Owls. And then I think there's a group already called The Owls. So it was The Four Owls. Yeah, yeah no, it all worked. And it's all the sum of its parts, right? This is this is a, a full cycle of all the history and knowledge and understanding and you know, business acumen, culture, mm. all at, in one place. So, you know, the perfect storm. Yeah, and... And it surprised us all, yeah. <laughs> like the perfect storm. Yeah, yeah, which, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I don't know, maybe, but uh, it, it, it surprised. It did surprise us. Yeah, it did surprise us. Well, it's it's opened up the whole conversation, the the doors of of music as a whole. It's it's. It was, I think it was a surprise to everybody how well high focus, maybe not flip tricks, but for high focus to excel. Mm. In, in competition with I don't know, maybe hospital records for instance or something mm -hmm. of a, a, of its time uh, a different genre like it was celebrated yeah. as the, the the platform for it. and ha owls were almost like the, the the vessel that took it to the took uh, took that mission brief to the to the masses yeah i mean i feel like among that, others, yeah, oh, no, of course. I mean, there's there's plenty of people on the label that had their part to play. I do think that ours as a group um, reached out to a wider audience. Like, it, I, I can even say for myself as a solo artist at that time, um, I wasn't having the same opportunities, and, and none of us were individually having the same opportunities we had as a collective. That's so, right. the ours as a group definitely pushed things forward for the label and for, for all of us as individuals, yeah. without a doubt. And then obviously, like, you know, there are certain songs we dropped which had quite a big impact mm. um, at different points in time. So, yeah, it, it, it was, we had a few moments. And I think that's what, that's what, um, that's what can really carry careers when you have moments that mm. have impact. Mm. 
people are more, you know, people are just going to remember you. You're going to be a part of people's uh, people's lives moving forward. People's mm. experiences are going to be tied to your music in a different way. So like I'm saying about capturing a moment, I kind of feel like as a group we did that a couple of times. Mm. So. You did? Yeah. Do you, um, you sound like a man that, va- of course most artists would value that more so... It's funny, isn't it? Because as you get older in this scene, in music, in the arts, you you, you understand that money's good to get by with uh, and creativity is the drug. Mm-hmm. But nothing beats someone coming up to you and saying, I remember, you know, you were the soundtrack to my XYZ back at da 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 or yeah. you know, that song changed my life because of da 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 Yeah, yeah, yeah. Crazy. No, for sure, those... those... Those moments, I do, I do try and take as much time as I can to appreciate those. Like if if someone tells you that you you know you've changed their lives for the better, mm. e- even in any little way, you have got to take that as 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 a blessing. You know, mm. as I think that is it's really important because life is about connection. So mm. if people are connecting through the music, then it's a, it's an extra element to it. Like the two things you just described, it's, it's a good way of putting it. You know, the, the money is good to get by with. We, we are doing this as careers, right? So mm. so we want to live live our lives and be able to create and money facilitates that. For the legacy. Right, right. And creativity is the drug. So like I say, you can't switch it off. Like when I'm in album mode and I'm trying to write something, uh, you know, I can't not play... If I need to listen to that, it's like I need to listen to it now. If I've yeah. got an idea, I need to write it down now. Yeah. You know, it, it is that drug. But yeah, it, you know, and and I think the other stuff when you realize the impact and that it's actually, you know, because you go through these times of thinking, is it really worth it? Is it really worth like dedicating everything to this, putting yeah. so much into this, sometimes to my own detriment, yeah. and things like that give it a bit of a deeper meaning. Mm-hmm. They, they just do. It's a bit. It's it's. It tastes so much more sweeter when it comes out and it's received, and all those times of those dark moments of just trying to evaluate the fours and against the reasons of why you do shit mm-hmm. creatively or whatever. Yeah, those dark moments, all of a sudden, it just it just feels that much more rewarding, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. But and see, the only other thing I'd say though, on the flip side of that, is I try not to get too caught up in. Uh, because there's a fine line between appreciating a positive impact you've had on someone and getting carried away with that and drifting into the ego state, uh, you know what I mean? Almost like a self-obsessiveness to... Yes, yeah, I think it's a struggle for a lot of artists, maybe. I yeah. don't know, it's something I'm, I try to be conscious of personally. Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah but, um, but the, as a, p- a people's poet, as somebody that's speaking for a... a an outside perspective, yeah, you've got to kind of retain some sort of like, yeah, removal of the ego to a, to to a greater extent, don't you? Yeah, yeah. Because that's not yeah. what people are built they shit on. No, exactly. People don't live yeah. like that. Yeah, that's right. That's right. What's the future, my brother? The future. Um, so I've got an album coming out later this year. <laughs> um gonna finalize the release date and let everyone know before that there'll be a couple more singles but we've just dropped the first single called your heart deserves <laughs> me on the vocals vic grimes on the beats um vic grimes like for the people that don't know him uh producer from canada but he was uh part of create uh create division with giallo point so shout Jeez. out to giallo point and uh yeah man he's just wow. it's, it's one of those online collaborations like we chat online, send music back and forth. And over a couple of years, we've built a project that I'm really happy with. And yeah, I look forward to rolling it out from here. So that's the immediate future. We're pretty far into a new four hours project. Again, like no specific release date, but I'd say next year, um, people will have that. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm looking to expand uh, beyond music as well. Uh, so... I mean, yeah, there's some things I'm writing. Uh, there's some other ideas I have. So yeah, that will all come. I don't want to say too much because mm. those ideas aren't far and far along enough yet. But yeah. um, yeah, I mean, it's it's all it's all part of the same tree. Uh, so 
I see, I see how well it all grows, basically. Wow, see, full of exclusives on well, this one. But yeah, yeah, exactly, mm. man. But all, always working, always, uh, always, yeah, moving forward with mm. it or trying to. Before we go, what's the uh, craziest thing that's happened in your career thus far? Oh man, craziest thing. Yeah, yeah. Let's just. That's on one a of those difficult. Off. That's one of those difficult questions. Man. I mean, there's different types of crazy. I mean, I think working with artists that. Um, I grew up as my heroes, so obviously there's Premier, but there's also Ed O G. Yeah, you know Ed O G. There was, uh, you know, Rock Mars, um, <laughs> Cool G Rap. You know, like I'm gonna I'm gonna forget names now, but you know, so th those moments are crazy in a sense of that's what I always dreamed of, like supporting M O P and supporting mm. certain acts that Mad. I used to listen to all the time. Even just that, you know that stuff that happened years back that kind of it doesn't if it happened tomorrow it wouldn't exactly wow me it just just in terms not that i wouldn't think it was significant but just in terms of i'm at this point in my career now but even when i i have to go back to those moments and think how crazy it was at the time when Did it first even, happened yeah because that then i look back at being a teenager and just getting into music and that's what i wanted to do but I, I, there was no certainty there. I never would have known that that would have actually happened. Mm. That's just what I was working towards and it did happen. So the, even that alone is just crazy to me. It's crazy to me that I'm even doing this as a job. That this is yeah. like, But, you know, that that's just what I do. That, so, I mean, maybe that's a boring answer. I, I can't think of, like, super crazy things that have happened in my career. Mm. You know, the, the stuff that really sticks out to me is, like, the stuff that I'm proud of or the stuff that you know it's it's been something that has just there's just been enjoyable in my life like a positive force in my life and created to me created the opportunity for me to go to different places in the world and and uh you know connect with crowds out there and yeah that's 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 what's really crazy to me about this whole thing that I'm actually doing it but uh, yeah I haven't really got past that to be honest it's, it's this beautiful engine that you put put in, get out what you put in. That's the beautiful thing about it. Well, yeah, it? yeah. That's I. You know, whenever anyone asks me for advice, that's the one thing I always say. Like, if you really love it, then feed the machine. Yeah, yeah. Then do it. Then just keep doing it. And you, you, if you keep doing something and keep trying to learn and keep working at your craft. You won't always get the exact thing that you want, but you'll always make progression towards it. Mm. Um, so, yeah, like like you say, man, feed the machine. I, I I agree. Like if that's what's if that's what you is you feel is your calling, if that's what you're passionate about, then then yeah, follow that. Mm. So there you have it. That's the Jerry Springer sign up. Right <laughs> follow one's dreams, feed the machine, people. Ferb, tea in the house. Thank you so much, my brother. Oh, it's a pleasure, man. Yeah? Thank you for having me. That was me. a vibe. No, it was it was nice talking to you. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, I'm glad we glad we got to do it. Yeah, felt, we did. It felt like 10 minutes there. <laughs> no, it's, it flies. The laptop's having a... I can hear it in the background. I think, fuck, no. Let's get this one signed off before we lose her. Uh, ladies and <laughs> gentlemen... <laughs> We'll explain another time, people. Ladies and gentlemen, Killer Killer Podcast, Outlet like In Without a Fashion Verb, Tea Inside the Place. Come on, four hours crew. Hold tight, everybody. Um, and everyone who's been a part of Verb's uh, journey, man. Um, all my South Coast crew. Uh, sharing is caring. Tell a friend to tell a friend. All right. Uh, crime don't pay, but neither do they. Don't talk to anyone I wouldn't. Stay lucky, people. Peace. Peace.